Yo, what's going on, people? It's your boy, Ape Poncho, and this is Cases Season 2, Episode 2, The James Fairweather Case, The Teenage Boy Obsessed with Serial Killers. James Fairweather, born the 5th of August 1998, was born in a stable home to caring and loving parents who had a strong attachment with them. Throughout primary school, he was seen as a quiet and well-behaved child, and in the report, it read that he was very hardworking, kind, and sensitive to the needs of others, with the following year's reports claiming that his confidence had recently soared, which seen James leaving primary school as a confident young man who was accepted by his peers, and to top it off, he was hardworking and enthusiastic, but that would all change in the transition to secondary school. At the age of 11, of course, James would attend his secondary school, Colchester Academy, and his behaviour would start to change, which caused him to bully pupils in fear he would get bullied himself, because one thing in particular that he would get slightly teased for was his prominent ears. Classmates reported that he would get in trouble often and took the blame for others' bad behaviour, and in one episode of Outrage, it was said that James was egged on by peers to assault another child because he wanted to impress them. It was said that he punched the people in the nose and then looked for approval by the other students who had egged him on by sharing high fives with them. That was in year 7, but as the years progressed in school, his behaviour was to deteriorate rapidly and after clashing with the teacher in school, a meeting was held in which he was described as violent, aggressive, and seeking out confrontation. At home, his parents would watch his troubled state of mind spread from the classroom to the bedroom as he became more reclusive and spent time away from his family, of course, spending much of it in his bedroom. When he was in year nine, his grandmother, who was described as a strong force in the family, had passed away, which was said to have come to a further blow to James and his already deteriorating behavioral patterns. Towards the end of secondary school in year 11, at that point, he was in the lowest sets of each class and some of his classmates recall him choosing murderer when asked what his desired career was and in his final assembly in year 11 at school he threatened a columbine style massacre but everyone brushed it off as if he was just lying for attention at this point he was described as isolated would grunt in response to his parents when they would try and talk to him and would eat in his room alone while alone in his room he began accessing violent porn as well as taking a keen interest in nazis by watching multiple documentaries on them it was said that he dreamed about working in a concentration camp and one Wanted to join fascist group Combat 18. On top of this, he would be researching and fantasizing about serial killers such as the Yorkshire Ripper and the Stockwell Strangler on his phone, as well as searching for an online encyclopedia of murderers. He had a DVD collection which consisted of titles such as Bind Torture Kill, Serial Killers, a documentary about serial killer Peter Sutcliffe, and a documentary about his favorite serial killer Ted Bundy. So, from a boy, he was once described as a confident, hardworking young man. He had now turned into a withdrawn, a violent individual who was obsessed with murderers who had spent his time watching violent porn. Then comes the 20th of January 2014. After spending months living in his own fantasy world turned on by serial killers, James would in his own words want to test himself by going to a local Martin's convenience store on Hunwick Road in the Greenstead estate and in his school uniform he would hold the shop up with a knife where he robbed cigars and a lighter but to add to how disturbing this individual was he didn't even smoke. So this backs up his claim about this first incident being a test for himself before he moved on to more serious crimes. After bragging about the robbery to pupils at his school, he was later on arrested over the incident. On March the 26th, 2014, he was sentenced to a year's supervision and was suspended from his school. Being 15 at the time, he avoided being locked up, even though the sentencing guidelines say that the starting point for similar offences is one year in custody. But only three days after that court date, he would go on to mark himself as the youngest person to attempt to become Britain's youngest serial killer. But first, let's go back to 2010. At the time, 29-year-old James Atfield, father of five, an Essex native, had been run over outside of a pub, which left him in a coma. When he recovered some time later, he suffered a brain injury, which left one side of his body weak. His reasoning and speech were affected due to the accident, and on top of this, he also suffered short-term memory loss, which made him an overall vulnerable person. He was very aware of his disabilities, so he would avoid crowded places and situations where he could get injured. As part of the process into rebuilding his life, he moved to Cogshaw to recover with his family before living independently in East Bay, Colchester with the help from brain injury charity Headway. Um, well, I had a coma and I was in the right red way apparently. My mind works alright, but my body sometimes does me down. Some people will see you, you've got a disability and 
think, Al, you must be stupid. On the 28th of March, just after 9am, he went to the post office on North Hill where he withdrew £350 in cash. After this, CCTV shows him going to Sainsbury's and then stopping off for a cigarette. He then goes to the local newsagents and heads home. Around 5pm, he was out once again, this time in the Tempin Bolden Alley in the town centre. He drinks a pint and roughly an hour later, he heads over to the River Lodge pub where he was a regular customer. Here, he spends roughly four hours drinking alone. At roughly 10.10pm, 10 he left the pub and headed towards the lake in Castle Park. Some seven-ish hours later, James was found by a female cyclist on her way to work, where he was found still alive, but unconscious, and in cardiac arrest, suffering from stab wounds. Five minutes later, paramedics arrived, he was rushed to hospital, and James was unfortunately pronounced dead at around 6.30am. A cordon remained in the area at the time, and police didn't initially arrest anyone in connection to his murder, but an increased police presence was put in Colchester Town Centre for the following week. On the 31st of March 2014, two days after he was pronounced dead, a post-mortem examination was held and revealed that James had been stabbed 102 times in his arms, hands, back, neck and head. Investigators would go on to say it was one of the most brutal attacks they'd ever witnessed and there was wounds on James that showed he tried to defend himself as he was getting stabbed and he got stabbed in the jugular vein which a pathologist said the air in the bloodstream from his cut may have contributed to his death. Speaking in a press conference, investigating officers from Essex Police would shed light on the investigation so far and would put out an appeal. There are 102 separate wounds on the body, which are believed to have been caused by a knife. This was a violent, frenzied attack on a vulnerable young man. He's had wounds on his arms, his hands, his back, his neck, and his head. We also have uh, information come in that a man was seen lying on the ground in the park around 1.30 a.m. in the morning. We've not been able to establish at the moment who that man is. So I'd ask if that person um, would contact the police so that we can um, speak to him about what he was doing there and in relation to our inquiry. At the moment, we haven't established uh, who's responsible or a motive for this attack. We also haven't recovered any weapon. However, I'd ask those who live in the, the local area, if someone came home, a partner or son or daughter, and had blood on their clothing, or came home with injuries they didn't go out with, or perhaps you've looked at your knife block and there's a knife missing, I would urge you to contact police so that we can follow out the information. After this appeal, an arrest would be made on a 38-year-old man in connection with the investigation, and he was later taken to a police station for questioning. And although, yes, an arrest had been made, his mum would put a further appeal out. James is in the process of rebuilding his life after a road traffic accident four years ago in which he suffered a severe brain injury, the effects of which left him with a weakness to the left-hand side of his body, which in turn affected his balance. His speech was also slightly affected and he suffered short-term memory loss and these things obviously made him very vulnerable. This to me seems a senseless and forensic attack on a gentle, vulnerable young man. So please, if anyone saw my son on Friday, please come forward. Somebody somewhere knows something. No matter how insignificant you may think it is, please inform the police. 
After this appeal had been put out, the investigation goes cold, with the 38-year-old man being released with no further action, although leading investigator Detective Chief Inspector Simon Werrett said the police had been given useful information after speaking to about 50 people since the appeals had been put out, and at that point they were trying to trace two people who had been sitting on a bench in the park. Then, sometime later, EFITs and CCTV pictures would be released to the public in the hopes that someone would come forward with information in regards to the incident, and due to the this, a 27 year old woman had been arrested but was let out on bail and was due to return at a later date. At this point, which would have been roughly two weeks after the attack, a murder weapon or motive still hadn't been found. Police would then go on to arrest a 33 year old man on the 23rd of April 2014 and there's no further reports in regards to the woman and this man of course who had been arrested but they would have been given no further action. But even with further appeals for witnesses with again releasing EFITs and the CCTV of people walking through the park, the police would still have nothing solid to go off, and that meant it was time to turn to BBC's Crime Watch for a big national appeal. Catching the criminals, protecting the public, this is Crime Watch. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next hour with this month's latest crime investigations, news and appeals. There are dozens of detectives in the studio right now and they are all ready for your call. We begin with the story of 33-year-old James Atfield. The father of five had survived a pretty tough time in recent years. In 2010, he was run over and left in a coma. He recovered but with life-changing injuries. You would have thought he had suffered enough, but in March, he was brutally murdered in his local park. In the last few hours, two men have been arrested in connection with the case, but inquiries continue, and we still very much need your help. Well, Detective Inspector Anne Cameron from Essex Police is here. Thanks for joining us. Um, a brutal attack, a sustained attack, and this was a very vulnerable man. Yes, since James' accident in 2010, he's very fragile and would have easily been knocked over, which makes this attack even more macabre. The person who carried it out would have definitely been covered in blood and they definitely had a weapon. We're very keen to locate that weapon and if anybody saw somebody on the Saturday morning with blood on them, we would be keen to hear from them. We should remind people, 102 stab wounds. In pursuit of talking to people who may have seen something that they don't even realise was important, let's take a look at this CCTV that you've brought along for us, Anne. Just tell us about these people here. Yes, we originally had 25 CCTV images that we were trying to identify the people. We have actually, thanks to the media, identified quite a number of them, and we are now down to seven images. These are the ones we're showing you now, and we'd be keen to identify the people that are on here. Yeah, if you think it's you, if you think you know the person, go online, check it out again, and get in touch with us tonight. There are other people that, that some witnesses who have spoken to you already say were in the park that night. Who were they? Yes, we're desperately trying to locate a male and a female that were actually sitting on a bench near the lake and they were there around midnight. There was also a male who was lying or sitting on the grass verge near the lake. We'd be very keen to identify and speak to those people. So after the appeal hit national television, the male and female that the police were especially looking for were identified. They were arrested in connection to the murder and were released on bail until a later date. But again, they were released with no further action. And at this point, which would have been about a month or so after the incident, the police would still have nothing solid to go off. So the next part in the case takes us to January of 2014 and we're introduced to 31 year old international student Nahid Almanea. Studying away from her home country of Saudi Arabia, she came to England to study in the Essex English Language Programme at the University of Essex. She lived with a brother who lives in the UK and it was said that she was very hard working and had ambitions to undertake a PhD in sciences. She was due to graduate her first year from the English Language Programme in August of 2014, but she would never get the chance to. Around and two and a half months after James was murdered, on the 17th of June 2014, less than two months before she would graduate, at around 11am she would walk alone down the Salary Brook Trail which led to her university campus off Avon Way in Colchester. She would normally walk with her brother but her brother's lecture had started early on that day so she decided to take the journey by herself. A short while later she would fall victim to an attack that would leave her dead in broad daylight. Initially after her body was found, police would go on to arrest a 52 year old man 
again in connection to the incident. Colchester residents were now in a somewhat panic because in the space of a couple of months, two people had randomly been knifed in random attacks with the general public wondering if they could fall victim next. A post-mortem examination was held two days after the attack and revealed that Nahid, just like James, had been stabbed multiple times, 16 to be exact, to a body, neck, head and arms, which had damaged internal organs including the brain, and the brain was damaged because two of the wounds inflicted were to her eyes. On this day, police would also release CCTV footage of Nahid's last moments to encourage witnesses to come forward. They also released a picture of the bag she was wearing and a map of the route she was likely to have walked down. As the investigation was developing, one of the main lines of inquiries that the police had looked into was whether she had been targeted because of her traditional Islamic clothing, but they also wasn't ruling out the connection between James's murder and hers, which is more than likely due to the nature of the attacks, and of course, both victims had been stabbed in the eyes, with the police adding that the murders were being treated as separate but parallel investigations. So at this point, even though I can't find specific tweets or social media posts, the news was reporting that there was a massive debate online whether they thought the attack was Islamophobic because of course she had traditional Islamic clothing on and because of this it then sparked fears around the UK that a terror attack was approaching as British ISIS fighter Abu Rashash Britani had tweeted out these kafar are getting out of hand, dare they touch a Muslim? I call upon any brother to take up a knife and kill as they did in Colchester. Others were claiming that there was a potential serial killer on the loose who had killed both James and Nahid and was looking for their next victim. Of course, if you're watching this video, then you'll know the answer to the debate. The 52-year-old man who was initially arrested was then released with no further action after police said that he was positively eliminated from their inquiries, but they would go on to arrest a 19-year-old man because a woman had reported that he attempted to grab her as she jogged in the town centre. But just like the 52 year old man, the 19 year old was released with no further action, but police would hint at that the two murders of Nahid and James were in fact linked after a criminal profiler had been brought into the investigation, rather than this being result of a hate crime, but still they didn't have anyone they could prosecute. Shortly after this, police would put out a £10,000 reward for the general public to claim if they gave information that led to the arrest and conviction of Nahid's murderer alongside the £10,000 reward that they had had up to catch James's murderer. The reason I bring this up will become more clear towards the end of the video, so bear this one in mind. 13 days after Nahid's murder, police found themselves speaking to a then 15 year old boy, that being James Fairweather. He was one of 70 people from across the North Essex area brought in for questioning about the killings of the pair because of his previous knife offence of course in the off licence which we've previously spoken about. Interviewed voluntarily with his mother at his side, he told police he'd been at home at the time of the killing. He was not questioned further due to no evidence to link him to the crimes and he was let go. A few weeks into the investigation it was revealed that 2,000 items of evidence had been recovered during the investigation so far and even though some arrests had been made, like we've previously spoken about, all people arrested were released. So with no killer being caught by police in both investigations and a potential serial killer at large in Colchester, Essex police would once again approach BBC's Crime Watch to put out another appeal in the investigations. <laughs> Now, in our last program, we appealed for your help to catch the killer of James Atfield. You remember that uh, James was murdered in a brutal knife attack in Colchester that happened at the end of March. He had been stabbed 102 times. Well, only a few weeks after our appeal, Saudi Arabian student Nahid Almania was also murdered in Colchester. The 31-year-old's body was found a mere two miles from where James was killed. Nahid had been on her way to a lecture at the University of Essex when she was stabbed 16 times. Well, DCI Lucy Morris, who's leading the investigation into Nahid's murder, joins me now. It's going to be very difficult for Crime Watch viewers not to listen to those two cases and somehow think that they are linked. What would you say to that? 
We haven't ruled out that possibility, but there's no definitive evidence linking the two murders. They remain separate investigations, but run in parallel. OK, so, so tell me what you do know about Nahid and what happened to her. Well, at 10.37 in the morning on Tuesday the 17th of June, a member of the public found Nahid's body on a footpath off Avon Way in Colchester. They called for an ambulance, but unfortunately they couldn't save her. As you say, she'd been stabbed 16 times. Now, uh, we are pursuing a number of different theories, but there's no clear motive um, and she doesn't appear to have had anything stolen. Um, the depth of this tragedy surely lies in the fact that usually she would have made this walk with her brother. Um, you have CCTV of her and her last movements. Just talk us through that. Yes, that's right. The Salary Brook Trail is a pathway commonly used by students walking to the nearby campus. That morning, she would have left her home address at Woodrow Way in Colchester, right. walked down Stanley Woodrow Way and cutting through the shops at Hunrick Road. And it's here that we see the last CCTV image of her at 10.19. Uh, she's seen wearing her uh, hijab headscarf. Um, now, you said 10.37 was when her body was found. As you've described it and where it is, it surely must have been a very busy part of the world, this. That's right. There's a number of people we still need to identify. And we're particularly keen to trace a male seen wearing a distinctive beige jacket, similar to this one. Now, he's described as a male of late teens to early 30s, about 5 foot 6 inches tall, of average build with short, dark hair. At DCI Morris, I should mention to people watching that you're also very keen to, to trace students who are no longer at the university but would be familiar and would have used this area. You also want to tell us just very briefly about a reward. Yes, that's right. For both investigations, there's a reward of £10,000 for any information leading to an arrest and conviction of those persons responsible. So a year would go by with, again, no major leads to go off, although multiple people had been arrested and re-arrested but eventually let go. And on the 27th of March 2015, police would once again put out an appeal to anyone to come forward to help them in their investigation to solve both murder cases. Then, just as we've seen before, the investigation goes quiet until Michelle Sadler took a dog for a mid-morning walk on the 27th of May 2015. She had spotted somebody with thick dark rimmed glasses standing alone on a footbridge close to where Nahid had been murdered. He was acting, she thought, suspiciously and she felt intimidated and anxious by his presence and so she decided to call the police. When police arrived, they arrested none other than at the time 16-year-old James Fairweather. James had told PC Scott Loomis at the scene he was one of the first responders that he'd gone out for a walk to clear his head and PC Loomis asked him if he had anything he shouldn't have and he responded yes. Fairweather was wearing rubber grip gloves and had a knife in his pocket. Following inquiries while in police custody he was then arrested on suspicion of murdering Nahid and James. So after questioning him police would then go on to charge him with the two murders and he was remanded into police custody to appear at Chelmsford Magistrates Court at a further date. At that date he spoke only to confirm his name and date of birth and answered yes when the court clerk asked him if he understood the proceeding and it was said that his parents who sat in the public gallery both shed tears as they heard the charges read out. So with the initial arrest and charge of James Fairweather being in May of 2015, it would be the following year on the 22nd of January 2016 where he'd be moved to the Old Bailey where now 17 year old James would go on to admit two counts of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility but went on to deny the two counts of murder and on this date the judge Mr Justice Spencer allowed the prosecution service to consider the pleas and whether they intended to pursue murder charges and if that was the case then a murder trial had already been fixed to start on April the 11th 2016 and it should be noted at this time James was being held in a psychiatric hospital rather than in a prison. So the prosecution would go ahead and pursue murder charges and the trial would get underway of course on the 11th of April 2016 but this time the trial would take place at Guildford Crown Court where it was revealed that 17 year old James Fairweather had a picture of Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe and DVDs about other murderers at his home which of course we've previously spoken about. Prosecutor Philip Bennett told the court material had been found on James's phone and at James's home about serial killers including Sutcliffe and the Stockwell Strangler. DVDs about Sutcliffe and films including horror series Wrong Turn and Snowtown inspired by a real life string of killings in Australia for you guys who didn't know were also found by police when they searched James's home. He'd also used his phone to look up a report into a man who had killed several elderly victims. The prosecution told the jury that James was 15 at the time of the killings, adding there was no dispute that he killed 
killed these two people. He went on to say, you will hear that the defendant gave accounts of experiencing auditory and visionary hallucinations that compelled him to carry out the killings. He went on to tell the jury that James's claims of experiencing such hallucinations had been deemed to be of doubtful authenticity by an expert, adding that the claims are a part of James's attempts to deceive. Now, as you guys know, up until this point, James Fairweather had been kept in a psychiatric hospital rather than in prison on remand. And the prosecution went on to explain that when he was being assessed over his fitness to be detained, he said, I've been hearing voices which have told me to murder people and I've murdered two people. In reference to the pair being murdered, he told him the voices had told him to sacrifice people. The prosecution went on to say that James pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the basis that at the time of the killings, his responsibility was diminished. But the prosecution added that they did not accept that that was the case. At a later court hearing, it was heard that PC Savory, who was called to the scene of James Atfield's murder, said that he was covered in that much blood. He couldn't make out the colour of his skin or hair and said that his right eye was protruding out of its socket, adding that a wound to his scalp had left his skull exposed. PC Savory would go on to explain that at the crime scene, it was revealed that a blooded trainer print was found about three foot away from James Atfield's body, adding that he noticed further footprints stretching about 10 metres away, which were consistent with somebody running away. At a further court date in a series of police interviews played to the jurors, as we previously spoken about once again, he would go on to say that the voices had told him to carry out the killings. During one of the recordings, he describes how whilst in police custody, the voices had told him to attack a female detention officer. He said, when the police lady came to my cell, the voices told me to strangle her. I was taken out to the exercise yard and they locked me up. That was a good thing because otherwise I would have got to her. He then goes on to describe how he would have strangled her to police. After this, jurors were shown police interview tapes of James going into detail about how he murdered James and Nahid. And he went on to say that he thought it was a good thing and the right thing to do because the voices were telling him in his head to sacrifice the pair as the voices told him that they were sinners. Referencing the murder of James Atfield, he recounts that whilst his parents had slept, he slipped out of his living room window at his home to search for someone to sacrifice around the estate, as this is what the voices in his head were telling him to do. He would then stumble upon James, who was sleeping on a park bench. Okay, some of the voices were talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice, or we're going to come and get you. You need to do it. And I saw him. It was where it was laying on the grass. Like, like that. It was like. Ah, just, just fast asleep, swear he was drunk. Then he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. So I went up to him. Can I stand up? Not yes. Up. Went up to him. I stood over like that. I'm not helping that. So I stabbed him first there. And I've done it a few times. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. Mm -hmm. He would go on to recall that James Atfield had let out a loud scream that went right through him and said that James pleaded, quote, stop, stop, as he launched the first blows to his stomach and head. He added, I was using lots of force. I went in the first ones and went into a rage. He was later asked by detectives how he felt after killing Mr. Atfield, with James responding that he was a bit sad, but the voices had controlled him physically and told him to do it. He said he was shocked when he heard later on the news that he'd stabbed Mr. Atfield 102 times and that he could not remember anything after a few minutes and going into a rage. But it should be noted what was mentioned in court is the fact that after both murders, he actually kept a collection of newspaper articles and internet history of him searching up and obsessing about his fame that he was getting from the murders. Referring to Nahid Almanea's murder, he told detectives that he attacked her with a bayonet that had a 10 inch blade on it. Going into more detail of the horrific murder, he went on to say that he snuck up from behind her, hit her with the bayonet, and James said he knew she was dead by the second blow. Of the first strike, he told detectives, she was walking away from me, she didn't notice me, I pulled the bayonet out, it went into a kitchen. I reckon. After this, he explained that he spun her around, knocked off her sunglasses, and she would fall to the floor, which would fracture her skull. He then went on to explain how he stabbed both of her eyes out, and when detectives asked him why he did this, he went on to say that he stabbed her in the eyes so that she couldn't see evil. After the killing, James said he bagged up his bloody clothes, hid them at his home before putting them out for the bin men to take away. The court also heard about the early theory that the attack was made because she was a Muslim, and the theory had been backed by the fact that James was interested in Nazism, but he told police that he killed her because 
because the voices had told him that she was a sinner. It was heard that James Fairweather had told police that he was hunting a third victim but was caught in the act. As we previously spoken about, he was acting suspicious on the Salary Brook Trail and later went on to tell police. I was going to get my third victim, but there was no one about. In reference to when the voices started, James would go on to say, it started a couple years ago when I got bullied at school. It would build up and build up tension. Then I started hearing this voice in my head and they were saying, why are you letting them do this? But I still didn't do nothing about it. At this time, I thought everyone gets that voice in their head. He said the voices continued to tell him, we need you to do another sacrifice as these people have committed sins. As we previously spoken about, dog walker Michelle Sadler had phoned police when she seen James acting suspiciously. In court, her witness statement would be read where it said, I saw a male standing alone on a bridge, leaning on railings, looking out to fields. I was about 12 feet away. I was feeling quite anxious and felt intimidated by his presence, especially knowing someone had been killed at the end of the trail around the same time on a Tuesday morning. It was almost a year since a lady was killed. I couldn't see if he had a dog. I didn't recognize him. I decided to get out of there. I didn't want to draw attention to myself. She met another woman walking a dog and together the pair returned to the area. By this point, James had moved and was standing by the side of the footbridge. Miss Sadler would continue. I thought his behavior was definitely odd. We both turned around with our dogs and walked back the way that we came. I stopped to call police as I was concerned. In defense, Simon Spence QC told Guildford Crown Court that James wouldn't be given evidence in his defense but told the jury to consider whether James, after seeing several psychiatrists, had managed to be successful in hoodwinking these medical experts with his claim that he was suffering from diminished responsibility. Dr. Simon Hill, a consultant forensic psychiatrist who had been caring for James in recent months, told the court of an August 2015 assessment in which James was describing the most antisocial of violent thoughts that he'd ever come across. He went on to say that James became agitated and shaking when he felt no one believed him. From this assessment, Dr. Hill felt James was suffering from an emerging personality disorder, but he could not rule out a psychotic illness. He went on to tell the court he was left with the feeling that James is extremely risky adding that James was fascinated by serial killers and that he thought that it was highly likely that the things he was reading had an impact on his offences because he was becoming preoccupied with them. In a further court date, just as we previously spoken about, Dr. Hill would go on to say that the press coverage of the deaths made James feel powerful and that violence in general gave James a warm and excited feeling. On top of this, he also added that James went on to explain to him that he felt like he was possessed by the devil himself. The court also heard that two drawings were discovered in James's prison cell showing daggers and faces with different expressions. On one of the drawings, it had a face of one half smiling and one half sad with the captions, a man that no one understands and the voices that no one wants to treat. Dr. Hill said that James reported at different times the voices telling him to strangle a patient on his hospital ward and rape another female patient. When he was initially admitted to the unit, he was kept in solitary confinement and ate his meals at separate times from others with plastic cutlery because he had told staff that he might harm others. Dr. Hill would go on to say that James admitted watching violent and pornographic films to him, having violent sexual fantasies and being obsessed with serial killers. But during an assessment with another forensic psychiatrist, that being Dr. David Ho of South Essex University, earlier in 2016, James said he had a flashback of the killing of James Atfield, which made him feel sick. Dr. Hill had told the court he believed it is either highly likely or more than likely the teenager was suffering from psychosis at the times of the killings, meaning he may have been aware of what he was doing, but he was not able to make a rational judgment. So with that being said, the prosecution then presented their leading criminal psychiatrist, Dr. Philip Joseph, who had assessed James earlier in 2016, where he pointed out that James had selective amnesia and went on to say that James's descriptions were a bit cliche and more like something you might see in a horror film. He went on to say that James has not mentioned voices until he was arrested in 2015 and Dr. Joseph described this as his fallback position. The doctor pointed out that James did not mention any voices, adding that it was inconceivable the experts at the center, his parents, the school, and everyone else would have missed the symptoms, which he described as being equivalent to someone having a severe headache every day, which disrupted every aspect of your life and nobody spotting it. 
He also reminded the jury nothing had been said about these voices when he was questioned about the Nahid al Maniya killing on June 30th, which was 13 days after she was killed, as we previously spoken about. Dr. Joseph revealed that James claimed he couldn't remember the details of the robbery in Colchester when asked about it weeks later, despite describing it as funny and claiming the voices wanted him to do something else after the robbery. Dr. Joseph also dismissed claims from James regarding visual hallucinations, including claims he was chasing a man in a tracksuit with a knife who disappeared, there was a four-year-old imaginary girl who kept appearing to him, an elderly man trying to kill him, and a hand and arm coming out of the television. The doctor said these were not convincing symptoms at all, and every time he's talking about voices, he's doing it to distance himself from what he's done. In his closing speech, the prosecution read an assessment by Dr. Joseph that it was likely the defendant wanted to emulate the acts of serial killers he'd read about. He added, Dr. Joseph's findings that the youth could be suffering from an emerging personality disorder had not affected the boy's ability for rational thought. But Simon Spence QC defending said the teenager was a 15 year old boy caught up in what I want to describe as the perfect storm of autism, increasing isolation and paranoia leading to the psychosis which led him to kill. Adding that it was ludicrous the prosecution had suggested that he could deceive three psychiatrists and it would have been an Oscar winning performance. Then after a two week trial and eight hours of deliberation over two days, the jury which can consisted of seven females and five males found James Fairweather guilty of the murders of James Atfield and of Nahid al -Manea. Judge Robin Spencer QC said he would sentence Fairweather for the murders on the 29th of April at the Old Bailey, as well as for the charge of possession of a bladed article, which he pleaded guilty for on the first day of the trial. He said the starting point for an under 18 would be 12 years detention, but has asked for reports from both the prosecution and defence addressing the issue of sentencing. Among those reports, he requested information on the impact of the crimes on both the victims' families and the Colchester community. Then, on on the 29th of April 2016, James Fairweather was sentenced to life with a minimum sentence of 27 years for the murders of Nahid and James. James Fairweather showed no remorse as he waited for a sentence to be passed, exchanging a thumbs up sign with his parents and joking with them as he sat in the dock. Sentencing him at the Old Bailey, Judge Robin Spencer said, It's plain that in carrying out these two murders, you were seeking to emulate other serial killers, such as Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. He described the killing of Mr. Mr. Atfield as a brutal, relentless and cowardly attack, adding, you must have realised when you was arrested the police were likely now to make the connection, but you were most importantly, in my judgement, still relishing the fact you were responsible for the two killings with all the media and police attention. The judge went on to say, for each of these two offences of murder, you will be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. That is the same as the sentence of life imprisonment, 27 years, less the 339 days you have spent on remand. If you are ever released, you will remain on license for the rest of your life. Getting led away from the court, James mouthed, I don't give a shit to his parents as they broke down crying. After the trial, it was revealed to reporters that the whole community had been affected by the killings and police had spent £2.6 million on the investigation with public reassurance and some 3,000 personal attack alarms being issued to people who felt vulnerable and of course a large number of extra officers being drafted into the area. Now remember how I said at the start of the video that there was a reward out leading to the arrest and conviction of the murderer, well that didn't go quite as planned for dog walker Michelle Sadler. As you guys know, she was the one who did meet the call to the police. She didn't receive nothing for helping out in the investigation. But she would go on to say, everyone who knows me knows I never did it for the money. I just know myself he wasn't going to get caught if I hadn't done anything, so I'm glad how it's turned out. Crime Stoppers, which is the charity that allows the public to give information about crimes completely anonymously, of course they offer the reward. They went on to say that Michelle Sadler was not eligible for the Crime Stoppers reward award in this case because she contacted the police directly. And on the 28th of September 2016, James had made an appeal against his conviction, arguing that the minimum 27 year sentence was excessive, but the appeal was denied. And that is the case of James Fairweather, Britain's youngest person to inspire to become a serial killer and nearly successful at doing it. Now, what I didn't mention is the fact that James had actually said if he'd not been stopped attempting to kill his third victim, then he would have gone on to kill at least 15 more people. And that's something pretty crazy to think about 
about seeing as at the time this was a 15 year old child but let me know what you guys think of this in the comment section below give the video a little like and if you want the latest drill street and music news out of the uk be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell it's been your boy ape honcho and i'm out